Hello everybody and welcome back to Sports Bazaar with myself Mick Malloy and of course as always I say it every week doing all the heavy lifting uh, bar none Titus O'Reilly how are you Titus? I'm very well. Alright well. now so what have you been nosing around with this week? This what have you I, found for us? I don't think you, you know this one at all so sometimes right. you have an inkling but this one I don't think you know this guy he's a guy called Denny McLean. Not ringing any bells. Mm-hmm. So, he was a famous pitcher for the Detroit Tigers. Okay. But to say... I like your baseball stories, I've got to say. this. Baseball... So, so far, you've knocked him out of the park. I think baseball, for some reason, it might be the slow pace of it, yeah. or the fact that there's a lot of Americans involved. <laughs> it's the two... Soccer and... I've got to say, soccer and baseball tend to give... They throw up a lot. I'm still uh, laughing at... Was it 10 Cent Beer Night? Oh, yeah. One of the classics. One of the classics. Go understand. back and listen to I that if you haven't listened to it. I don't understand when that idea was pitched that no one rang alarm bells at all. No one I, thought, hang on, this could be problematic. The thing about Ten Cent Beer Night is there's that <laughs> bit in that movie uh, Groundhog Day yes. where he's annoyed that he goes, you know, I'm repeating this quite boring day over yes. and over. Like he's saying, oh, there was once a night, day where I met this woman and we drank cocktails on the beach. And Fantastic. why couldn't it be that day? I often think if I was going to relive a day over and over, <laughs> 10 cent beer night would be pretty fun. I often think about, you know, time travel and people go, oh, where do you want to go? Back to the Renaissance? Yeah, or, yeah. No, 10 cent beer <laughs> night. Thank you. <laughs> So I was talking to a guy who lives in Cleveland yeah. after we'd done that episode and uh, he said there's still great civic pride. <laughs> over the, the, so if you don't know what we're talking about, go back and listen to that episode because it's, it's one of our favourites. All right. So Denny McLean, so let's go through. His name, he's born in March 29, 1944. Uh, he's named Dennis Dale McLean, but he was always known as Denny McLean. Yep. Born on the south side of Chicago. He grew up in a very working class neighbourhood. His mother, Betty, was described as remote. Right. Which is <laughs> never what you want. His father, Tom, was described as angry. They were both uh, Irish Catholics. Okay. So, you know, Irish Catholics on the south side of Chicago. All right. Yep. I'm getting um, a picture. His dad had been a star high school shortstop. And he married his uh, Betty at 18. This is his parents. And she said, I don't want you to travel chasing a baseball career. So he stopped and didn't do it. So when Denny was born, his dad's in the army in Europe and went on to have jobs as a truck driver, insurance advisor, and made a lot of money giving, or money on the side giving electric organ lessons, <laughs> which Denny takes up as well. Okay. He becomes quite proficient on the electric organ. Sure. His dad was very hard working, but he was also a chain smoker, big beer drinker, and he used to have angry outbursts that Denny and his brother uh, always had fears of these outbursts. But yeah. despite that... I know the type. They really liked him. Yeah. He was a big influence on them despite okay. this. Um, and so at one point, his dad got in a fist fight <laughs> with a heckler who was heckling one of his son's Denny's Little League games. <laughs> Okay. You know those parents on the sidelines oh, during the sport? That, yep, yep. And they never think another parent's not going to fight them. That's their mistake with, with we Denny's put, we dad. We had to put up with that a lot at my football club, uh, Australian Rules. Yeah. I played for a club called Mount Eliza. And Mount Eliza was perceived unfairly to be a very toffy and affluent area yeah. in a league that was full of bad teams. Because you had a lot of Frankfurt ones and, and all this yeah. stuff. So their, their supporters used to get into us every week. So they used to come to the games just to heckle us. Yeah, little pretty boys, your spoon and your silver spoon in your mouth and your this and your that. Yeah. Every week it was just got to the point where it was so bad. Anyway, one day our supporters had had enough. And, uh, I this think is at a junior league? A junior league. And the Seaford were there and they were leaning over, giving us a grief. And one of our supporters turned around and said, Shut up, mate, or I'll put up your rent. <laughs> it was with great pride that we assumed that that was a our fight back. <laughs> so you know that you know the um, in a lot of the especially in the Eastern European teams in soccer they have the ultras the big yep. soccer fans who have flares and an oh, yeah. for violence and all that. Mm-hmm. I saw uh, one on social media. I think it was a Turkish club. That the big ultras, there's like a thousand blokes all like you know ready to fight, yes. throwing flares and with signs sure. and chanting. They showed up at the this club, which is a professional club, it goes all the way down to under sevens, yeah. And they showed up at the under sevens game, 
<laughs> carried on like they were at a Champions League match. I just, I, I'll find the footage and put that it on their socials. It's one of the great, hilarious. just intimidating, these <laughs> seven-year-old kids running around. I love it. Anyway, so his dad was a sort to get in a fight um, at all this uh, sort of sure. stuff. Denny, though, became, by the age of 12, he once took the family car for a joyride. And he, so even though his dad was pretty angry and pretty tough, yeah. Denny was a bit of, straight away, was sort of, you know, he's a bit of a wild boy. Um, but despite this, he never liked his mum. He said his mum was cold and heartless woman who would never get involved uh, in if their dad was beating them up or anything. So she, he she unhappy? She feels, feels like she's... Well, it's interesting because despite while this is all going on, he, he, he follows his dad because his dad was into baseball and playing the organ. So Denny right. both hates and loves his dad in a way. Sure. that love hates him. Okay. He also grew up in this family, which is kind of interesting. He said, I had three uncles on the police force. So the Irish or the, the Irish. Chicago. Yeah. Of course. This is classic. And he said... Um, they were very poor, but he remembered one of his uncles, who was six foot five, um, he once, when he was later playing baseball, bumped into him after a game. And his um, uncle said to him, what a great thrill it was to be able to beat on people legally. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So this well is done. the sort of family he grew up in, right? Like Living the dream. All, yeah. Um, Danny starts playing baseball and at eight, he's a star in Little League. Like he just strikes everyone out and he loves it. He loves the yep. acclaim. And he goes on to, and uh, goes to high school and becomes a star there pitching. Yep. But in 959, when he's 15, his father, dad is driving out to watch him pitch for high school. And he pulls off the road, slumps over the steering wheel and dies of a heart attack. Okay. And this is a huge impact on that. How, how old is he? he Danny's 15. 15, okay. So what makes this even worse is um, within a few months, his mum remarries. So I think that's what his mum thought of his dad. <laughs> that's why we sh she was so remote. All yeah. The time. So by 15, his dad's just died. His mum has disappeared off with the new bloke. And Denny... Oh, she's shot through. Is, well, she's te he's technically living with her still, but she's just not interested in them anymore. Okay. Yep. And so Denny's just basically doing whatever he wants from about the age of 15. Um, but he's so good, he keeps getting... Um, to all different baseball teams. He actually leads the team to three city championships. He basically can't lose on the mound. Everyone tells him he's fantastic. And he says, when you're told every day how great you are, you turn to believe what you hear. And this is going to set him up for the future. He says, you begin to think you're bigger than you are. His role models are Arnold Palmer and Frank Sinatra. He says, Sinatra doesn't give a damn about anything and neither do I. I want to make $100,000. I want yachts and huge houses, maybe palaces. I want all the money I can spend, and brother, that's a lot. All righty. So that's him. Yeah. So he graduates in 1962 and immediately signs with the White Sox in Chicago, receiving $10,000 bonus and $7,000 bonus if he makes it to the major league. So he turns up uh, to Harlan, Kentucky to play for the Smokies in the Class D Appalachian League. This is the minor league okay, of baseball yeah. on his way. Um, he makes his debut um, and he tosses a no-hitter and strikes out 16 batters. So Straight off the he's bat. He's just straight off. Brilliant. Um, he's only there for a couple of weeks because he's so good he gets promoted almost immediately. But in that time, he already defies team rules by making a 30-hour round trip to visit his girlfriend in Chicago on his off day <laughs> and gets in trouble. But he's so good they, do, they ignore it, which yeah. sets the pattern of behaviour that we're going to That's see. That's a green light. Uh, he just put worked out, if I keep throwing no hitters, no one's ever going to punish me. Correct. So he's so good he gets promoted again. And he starts dating a woman called um, uh, Sharon Boudreau. She's the daughter of uh, Lou Boudreau, who was an announcer for the Chicago Cubs and he's in the Hall of Fame for baseball, yep. so a real star. And they get engaged uh, in 1963, so he's only just finished high school, very young, and they're married. Um, so he then get, finds out that the White Sox, because he's played a, a year in the minor leagues, they either have to draft him or he goes into the draft. Right. And they decide they... They decept, they actually don't protect him in the draft. They say, "Well, we we don't we've got an abundance of pitchers, so he gets wow. traded basically to the Detroit Tigers." So this is how he ends up in Detroit. Did they pounce? Was he? Yeah, up? he was good enough that they were like, "We'll we'll take him." And it was only because the the White Sox had so many, yeah. so he's leaving his Chicago for Detroit. So he then uh, comes along other things. Now, one thing that happens in this time is in the minor league, still he learns from one of his managers how to handicap horses for gambling 
and becomes lifelong obsessed with gambling, which okay. is going to lead him to all sorts of problems. <laughs> he also finds his other great um, love in life, which is womanising. <laughs> Yeah, so he's got this is a lobbies. lethal combination for the fella. There's not many gamblers that probably aren't womanizers. I hate to I broad stereotype with a broad brush. It's, it's built in <laughs> to the DNA. It doesn't happen that jump. So uh, that's sort of what goes on. But this is the point where he, once he gets to Tiger Stadium, he starts to be noticed. So he takes his debut in the major leagues. He's he's moving up and down between the minor and major yep. leagues at this point. He hasn't solidified it there. But at the age of 19, he comes and pitches at Tiger Stadium against his own team, the White Sox. This is his debut, September 21, 1963. He comes away with a complete seven hitter, only seven hits giving up, um, and um, basically dominates pitching on thing and also gets up and hits a home run in his first game. On fire. Which pitchers don't do. It's the only home run he ever hits in his major <laughs> league career. So by this point, he's bouncing back and forth, but by 1965, he's back in the full time in the majors and he has this season where he goes 16 and 6 with a 2.61 earned run average. So that's on average, he gives up less than three runs a game, which is amazing. Yeah, strikes out everyone, and he becomes one of the best pitchers. And by this point, so he's becoming a star. Um, in the 1966 season, he goes even better. And this is where some of his character starts to come through. He wore one tinted contact lens and one untinted contact lens. For what purpose? Just so he looked weird. <laughs> and this is in the 60s. That would be yeah. scary on the mound. Is, yeah. he, is he playing like this? Yeah, yeah, he plays like this. And then he... Changes his hair colour almost regularly from blonde to red and black and back again all the time. Here we go. Now, in the middle of this, suddenly he's a, he's a star. He's growing. He's suddenly a, like one of the best pitchers yeah. in the league, right? And the people are saying he's also people start to notice he's got an outsized personality. Yep. Because he will say anything in an interview. Sure. He'll bag the team, his own team, his teammates, <laughs> uh, other players. He'll bag the city, the fans. <laughs> Like, he just bags everyone. Fantastic. At this point, he also is playing the organ in clubs around the Midwest it, hang on, at all the, the at, time while playing baseball. At the baseball? No. He's not like, the organ player at the baseball. No, no, but he can. He does do that a bit late down the track. But he's So he will play a game of baseball and then he'll go and do gigs at the same time on his off days. So okay. he gets a $25,000 endorsement deal with Hammond Organs. <laughs> Because they're like, there's this pitcher that can play the organ really well. Have we got a picture of that? <laughs> yeah, like there's heaps of ones, right? Now, his biggest vice at this stage is he has a huge appetite for Pepsi. <laughs> a bit like John Daly with the Diet <laughs> Cokes, right? But this is well before it. He would have 24 bottles every day. Stop it. A slab of Pepsi That's every day. Much. That's too I, much. <laughs> look, I'm not a stickler for a strict diet. You Look at me. <laughs> but that's... You Not think on. 24 bottles can... of Pepsi is too much? Well, that's a bottle an hour. I know. That's how much he honestly drank. And this this does come to... <laughs> it comes to impact him eventually. Pepsi hear of this obsession. He, <laughs> mentions, mentions it, it, he mentions it in an interview. He goes, I love Pepsi and I drink 24 bottles a day. Yeah. Pepsi don't go, that sounds like too much. They go, we'll sign you as a sponsor. They pay him $15,000 a year. Plus ten cases, which is two hundred and forty <laughs> bottles delivered to his house every week. Every week, Mick, two hundred and forty bottles delivered to his house every day. He's living the dream. Um, so he's suddenly making twenty five thousand dollars off Hammond organs and fifteen thousand dollars off Pepsi, plus all the free Pepsi, and so he's making more money off the field than pitching because this is in Fantastic. the sixties, right? Now the big thing out of Signing Pepsi apart from a future like of obesity and di- diabetes. <laughs> type two. He soon realizes that he and Edwin K. Schober, who's the marketing vice president of Pepsi Cola, they shared an affinity for gambling. Okay. Right. So so Pepsi is bad for him in two ways. Yeah. So they love gambling together. They get along like a house on fire. Like Danny's a star, Pepsi's sponsoring him, they hang out all the time, they both live in Detroit. What type of gambling? Are we go to the track. Horses the mainly. Horses, or horses mainly. Yeah. They love the horses. Um, they realise after a while that to fund their losing gambling habits, that it would be much better if they ran a bookmarking operation. So they okay. become hands-off, silent partners in a bookmarking, a bookmaking, there thing, you go. which will come back to bite him later. Not content with travelling like with the rest of his team, he also gets into flying and he buys his own airplane and learns to fly it 
and he convinces the Detroit Tigers, the baseball team, to let him fly himself to games. <laughs> This is hilarious. <laughs> so when everyone else is getting the team flight, yeah, here he comes. Here he comes. <laughs> Bob Gibson has this, who is a much nicer person than Denny, it turns out, <laughs> but at the time has this absolute menacing demeanour that even his own teammates and opposition players were scared of him, wow. right? Managers would never pull him from a game, even though he's a pitcher because <laughs> he was so scary. He said... Um, one of his former managers said you wouldn't see him talk to the other players at all. It seemed like he just hated them. He said, I ain't going to get friendly with anybody. And McLean said he was a nasty guy. Nasty. He was antisocial. We did the Bob Hope show together that year and the guy barely spoke to me. He's a thousand percent better now, but he's still intimidating. Yeah. So this is what you've got. You've got Gibson really like it's terrifying everyone. So suddenly, this is how tough Gibson is. Mm -hmm. In 1967, the year before this, he was pitching for the World uh, Championship that year and they only went on to win the World Series. And Gibson, in the middle of it, he's having a dominant season. Uh, at one point, Roberto Clemente, he hit the ball really hard and it went all the way in and it went, you know how quick it goes from the pitch yep. up from the thing? It hits Gibson in the leg and actually fractures him, his leg above the right ankle. Gibson yeah. still refuses to go off and pitches to the next three batters on a broken leg. <laughs> so that's what he's like. Wow, okay. So this is this huge thing, and what has happened at this point is baseballs have been very dominated by pitchers. They'd actually, after 961, shortened the um, strike zone after Roger Maris broke, set the record. Yep. Um, so pitchers are dominating, and so... McLean and Gibson are just putting on this clinic and everyone's watching because it becomes this race who can get to 30 wins, which hasn't happened in about 60 years. So they're all like, can someone actually break this record? Yep. McLean starts the year early in May by criticising Detroit fans for being the biggest front-running fans in the world, front-runners <laughs> and the world's worst. If people go along with us and stay off our backs, we will win this thing. Unbelievable. So that's what he says to Detroit about his own fans. And did the fans love him? Mm, they had a mixed relationship uh, with him, right? When he was when he was playing well, they were on board. Yeah. So they were just now. This is what he was like. Jim Northrup, who Jim Northrup, who played right field for the Tigers, said, "I remember a game. I think it was against Washington when Denny was ahead three zero in the ninth inning. Denny's first pitch was a fastball hit for a home run." His second pitch was a fastball, which was also hit for a run. Then he struck the next three batters out, all with fastballs. I went to him and said, Denny, did it ever occur to you to throw anything but a fastball? He said, why? When was the last time you saw anyone hit three home runs in a row? <laughs> <laughs> now, Fantastic. Now, this is That's Denny. That's great. While McLean's pursuing these 30 wins against Bob Gibson, Gibson's just only focused on baseball. Mm. McLean's zooming around in Learjets, which he's flying. He's playing his Hammond organs. He's swinging, swigging his Pepsi Cola. He's hanging out with Steve Allen, Bob Hope, Ed Sullivan, Joey Bishop, Glenn Campbell, and the Smothers Brothers. What? Because this is because he's got this Hollywood he's kind got, of. He plays organ back. on all their shows and all this sort of stuff. He's on the cover of Time and Sports okay. Illustrated at the same time. All while this is happening, he records an album. <laughs> right he yes. gives organ what lessons. was the genre it's all just organ music yeah. like he records he gives organ lessons out of his home to two dozen students at three dollars fifty an hour <laughs> this is all while pitching right um he went around and booked himself in advance into the riviera in vegas and the detroit auto show and disneyland and a hundred other places for him to play so he's running around booking gigs yeah um his catcher says the rules for D just don't seem the same as anyone because, as the rest of us because he, he'd finish a game, then get in his plane and fly to a gig in Vegas, play a gig and then fly back to the next thing, like doing whatever he wanted, right? Um, so McLean, this is an idea. On one day, he beats the Oakland A's on a Sunday. He charters a jet to Las Vegas for Monday. Then he flies to Houston and pitches another two games at the All-Star game. <laughs> Then he returns to Vegas, all flying himself, yep. to book off-season engagements into various casinos. Then he flies to Minnesota to rejoin the Tigers. That's like his normal flight and stuff like that. Um, Unbelievable. This is how chaotic this year is for him. All the time, the media's following mm -hmm. him. One time he's in Minneapolis, he's playing an organ gig. 
around. Just uh, getting this is in the middle the of the season. Yeah, there's yeah. a big market for organ players. Yeah, it's big. Like, and he's a star. Right. Suddenly, he remembers while he's in Minneapolis that he's scheduled for that same afternoon. He's got a gig that night in Minneapolis, but he then remembers, oh, I'm meant to do an afternoon music store appearance in Detroit for the album to sign autographs. Right. So he f- quickly gets in his plane, <laughs> and flies back to Detroit, goes to the store, and finds it empty. Which is weird because he's a big star yeah. in Detroit, especially. Going on. So he goes up to the manager who doesn't recognize him straight away and goes, Isn't Danny McLean supposed to be playing organ here? And the store manager said, Yes, next Saturday. And Danny goes, Oh, thank you, and leaves and flies back to Minneapolis. <laughs> he then has another game where he, he plays and he wins. He then goes out for drink afterwards with Glenn Campbell, who wrote Which Delightman. <laughs> right? So he goes out for drinks afterwards. He then doesn't really sleep, goes to Disneyland the next morning to organise more gigs, then goes to Capitol Records to pose for publicity photos. Um, Then he goes down the street to tape the Steve Allen show, plays organ, uh, catches up with um, Steve Allen and Pat Harrington Jr., who was an actor at the time, and then goes all the back quickly to play the game. So this is what he's sort of doing. Then he pitches the game, then they all have to fly back to Detroit and it's 1 a.m. in the morning, and he sits in the co-pilot seat and helps fly the plane all the way to Lowen back at 7.30 a.m. <laughs> he basically hasn't slept for 24 hours. Fantastic. So he's doing all this sort of stuff. He's absolutely clear. He says he can't remember. On the September the 14th, Saturday afternoon, he finally wins his 30th game of the year. This is a huge deal. This was a, Is he the first to 30? It, no, but it hasn't been done since... Um, it hasn't been done since a guy called Dizzy Dean did it, which about 30 years before. And back then, that was a very rare thing to do, right? To break to because back yeah. then baseball, this was the last time it happened was before the real home run era yeah, yeah, and everything, yeah. right? It okay. was it was thought to be an impossible thing to do. So, but he's he's won the race this season. He's won the race, and you got to remember he's on the cover of Time for this. Yeah, so it's cool. a huge thing, right? So he wins. He says there's... For a, what? His organ playing? His Pepsi <laughs> drinking? Or his pitching? So he says he says he can't really remember winning the 30th game. He said that whole year is a blur. One of the reasons was the Tigers actually rallied from behind in the ninth to win that game. And McLean, overjoyed, leapt high off the dugout bench and brained himself on the concrete dugout ceiling, leaving himself dazed. Good Lord. So... He gets up and is interviewed straight after by Sandy Koufax, who was a famous pitcher, yep. and Dizzy Dean, who held the record. Um, and even in the interview, he proclaims that Tigers fans are the world's greatest fans. <laughs> <laughs> I love you guys. So he does that on September 14. On September 16, Capitol Records releases Denny McLean at the organ. <laughs> He'd recorded two... Um, of Denny McLean at the organ and another one, Denny McLean in Las Vegas, which is a live album that oh, year. Of course. He put out two. He once was interviewed in the uh, about uh, recently, and they said um, he said uh, if you'd like to hear it, I can sell you a couple of thousand copies. <laughs> <laughs> he finishes with a thirty-one and six record, an ERA of one point nine six, which is just absolutely like ridiculous. Take your word for it. Bob Gibson, his competitor in this, finishes twenty-two and nine. But his team isn't as good. So, yeah, right. But he finishes with an ERA of 1.12, which is like so low, it's almost, that's just ridiculous. So they're both very good. They both win in each of their leagues. One's in the National League, one's in the American League. They both win the MVP award and they win the Cy Young awards each, which are the best pitchers yep. in the league. Um, also, they're destined now to meet in the World Series. So you've had this okay. all year. Here and we go. Before the season ends, though... Danny's made his 30, he's got to 30, and he grew up idolising New York Yankee centre fielder Mickey Mantle. Yep. He actually faces Mantle in his last season on September 19 that year. And Jim Price was the Tigers catcher that day. And when he and uh, when Ma- Mantle came up, Denny and him conspired to give Mickey Mantle a going away gift of a home run. <laughs> right? What? Because <laughs> he's his idol. Um, so what? The catcher's telling him what's coming. So Mantle's about to retire. He's tied with Jimmy Fox with 534 career home runs, which makes him, I think, the third highest in in history at the time. And they want him to get it outright, 
right? They want him to get it. So is he already, betting on this? Well, Detroit's already clinched the American League pennant, and Denny's one is thirty. So Denny's and they're up six, and I think they're up six uh, one at this point. So game. he's like one home run. What I care. So um, he Denny calls the catcher out to the mound when Mantle comes up, and and he says, "When I got there, there's the catcher." Denny said, "Hey, big guy, should I let him hit one?" <laughs> I said it was a great idea. Mickey was always nice to me. So I went back behind the plate and Mickey, like he always did, was tapping the plate with his bat when I said, want us to groove one for you? Mantle didn't really believe Price that they were really going to do this. And he looks up and sees McLean nodding in agreement, like all happily. <laughs> and he understood. So um, the catcher Price says to Mantle, high and tight, mediocre cheese, which means mediocre speed. Yeah. McLean pitches one and... Mandel watches it and it's just this absolute cheese ball down yeah, the yeah. middle and lets it go because you just can't believe they're doing, they're doing it. it. They throw the second one, it's the same again. He suddenly cottons on. It's on. These guys are giving me a home run. Um, so he pitches the third one and Mandel hits it in the upper deck in the right field. <laughs> it's the second last home run of his career and gives him sole possession of third place on the all-time home run list, only behind Babe Ruth and Willie Mays. You're welcome. McLean's clapping as Mickey rounds the bases. <laughs> so weird. He's actually clapping his hero. He just hit home run off him. <laughs> the next batter was Joe Peppertone, and he said, Give me one too. He wasn't Give the Give me one too. I want one. And the catcher says, No way, you're not Mickey Mantle. McLean responded by throwing the next pitch at Peppertone's head. <laughs> <laughs> This is just outrageous, 